All right, welcome back, everybody. Today we've got episode eight, only the eighth episode of the Blake Builders podcast YouTube show. And I am extremely, extremely blessed to be able to have the opportunity to talk to Brad Levitt with AFT Construction. Brad is the president and founder of AFT. And uh, Brad doesn't know this really, but Brad has played a huge impact um, in my, you know, my business life as far as looking up to him and what he does down there um, with AFT and the social media. And I really look up to Brad. And so when I had, when I reached out to Brad to come on here and he responded right away, I was very, very excited. And we've, we've met previously, um, one time, but, uh, hopefully that we'll see each other again in, in, in real life. <laughs> um, but Brad, thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, I'm excited to be here, Blake. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, um, you're uh, president and founder of AFT. Anything else that you, uh, any other introduction or titles that you uh, do there? <laughs> uh, no, that title is how most people know me and that that probably suffice, you know, for everything. We, we do have some other companies that we do that I'm a, a partner in, you know, of course, dad, six kids, you know, all that good stuff. But, uh, but yeah, most people know me as president of AFT, so. There you go. Yeah, I see you're uh, on social media, you're Tra you travel a lot with the family and I don't know how you keep up with that. Stuff. <laughs> it's crazy. It's busy and we try. I mean, it's a, it's a crazy life, not a lot of sleep, but it's worth it. You know? Yeah. No, I love that. You're uh love that you're a family guy. Just, just like myself. So yeah. Um, yeah. Family. So uh, a few questions we're going to run through here. Um, a lot of these we do pretty short and sweet. So we'll, we'll be under probably 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so tell me, tell the followers a little bit about the percentage of residential versus commercial that you guys do and kind of how that mix up is for you guys. Oh, that's a good question. You know, it's, it's funny how this has evolved. So we've always been both commercial residential and over the years, you know, we've been in business nine years now. I, form, I, I started and formed the company in March, 2013. So we just hit our nine year anniversary uh, here yes. in the Phoenix area. Yeah. Thank you. So it's pretty exciting. So in the beginning, it was 50, 50 right? Residential, commercial. And then over the years, it kind of changed, right? Because as you know, if you're looking at just number of projects or like dollar volume, you know, that pendulum would, would, would be different either way. But what's funny is now, like in 2022, which is where we're at, mm -hmm. I mean, that pendulum has gone completely high in residential. Um, it, we're still doing some commercial, but it's almost 90% re residential to 10%. And, and part of that's been strategy. I mean, I've always had both because I know how the economy can fluctuate, it changes, right? So as a company, you have to understand what your specialty is. And for us, we do have a specialty product in both residential and commercial, but you have to be versatile. And right now, my challenge with commercial, uh, I love commercial, but right now where commercial is really dictated by, they got tenant has to get in. You know, there's money to be made. They have to have occupancy. They have to have... Mm -hmm. You know, the clock's ticking, right? Residential, it's not the case. And so right now where you have limited labor, limited material, as a company, we've elected to go more residential just because we have a little bit more leniency there, you know, dealing with all the issues that most of us are dealing with right now. Right. Yeah, that's, that's I'd say we're probably 90% residential and 10% commercial. Um, we do the occasional tenant finish build out. Um, we're doing a little multifamily project right now, but um, the residential market's still very strong here. And uh, I know interest rates are creeping up a little bit, but I still feel like our housing, we have a big housing shortage, um, at least here locally in Nebraska. So yeah, same here. Um, so social media, man, you are the king of social media, I feel like, <laughs> for, uh, for builders, residential, and, and probably commercial too. But um, everywhere I look, you're there, which is just awesome. And, and um, I really look up to you on that uh, on that front. So tell me, you know, I guess, number one, do you get, do you feel like you're getting leads in it? Is it more of a branding opportunity? Like what's your, what drives you every day to post? You know, what is that? Uh, that's a really good question, Blake. Um... As you think about social media, and this is something I speak to a lot, you know, when I started social media, and just to give a little background why I started and how that's changed and evolved now, mm -hmm. is that in the beginning, um, as a new company, younger guy, I had experience in town, but I didn't have the connections, right? And by the connections, I mean, I didn't have a resume where I built in some of these premier communities. I hadn't worked with some of these architects under the name AFT. I did at my last company, but not under my brand. Mm -hmm. And so social media was a way to really show, here's what we're capable of. Here's the product we're doing. 
here's the quality, the site cleanliness, whatever it may be. And it really was an opportunity for me to create the message, right? And, and what that evolved to is now these top architects and designers that wouldn't take my time or wouldn't return my call, that now this is was a non-soliciting, non-confrontational way for me to begin to work with them, right? And for them to see our content without me, mm-hmm. you know, just picking up the phone and annoying them with a phone call or an email they wouldn't respond to. And, and it's totally evolved because now it is far and away our biggest lead generation, right? The, the public and, and our customer base has followed us for years. They've, they've seen the projects, they've seen the scope of work. And especially as we've gotten into some of the more challenging hillside and complicated builds, you know, the, we're doing the home of the year, the net zero home of the year. Yeah. So these clients that are looking into energy efficiency or ICF or uh, a complicated hillside build, they know that we can do that. We have the resume and, and, and it's a more trusted yeah, enterprise can, because we're out there, we're public. Yeah, they can hop right on LinkedIn or Instagram or wherever and just see the see the pictures, the progress, how you operate, how you guys you know, your, your checklist of how you, you know, you're obviously your new video series, your new series of, of the, of the project is obviously huge. Just documenting that. And it's always cool too, for you, like in 20 years, look back and be like, that's really neat to see how I, how we built that project and the, you know, yeah. the, team, the team members on it too. You know, there's people that always be like, you know, even on the, our personal page, all my personal Blake page, people ask like, why are you post so much? Well, it's fun to look back at those memories, you know, um, with you know family and, and friends and whatnot. Um, so yeah. do you run all the social media yourself? I do. Yeah. So hundred percent, I'm doing all of it. So, uh, uh, the one thing I do is I do have a video guy that helps with YouTube. So he's doing like, we'll, we'll meet on site and he'll film mm-hmm. the YouTube portion and then he'll do the editing, but that's it. I mean, everything else from content creation, as far as, you know, the topics or the photos that I'm posting or the Instagram reels. Uh, LinkedIn, that's all run through me. We don't have any outsourced parties, so it's all. So I'm taking care of it, which is which is a lot of work. It is, but you know what? It, like people ask me that too. They're like, "Who runs your social media?" It's it's doing great. I'm like, "Well, it's me." And the reason yeah. it is because I actually truly enjoy it, and it adds that you know it adds that personal touch to it too. It's not just someone out there taking pictures and posting it, you know, just of a random kitchen or whatever. There's something behind it. So. Um, We'll dive into the next kind of interesting question. I, I always struggled this too as I grew the business. So the residential, as far as like project manager, which um, for anybody listening, a project manager to me and to Blake Builders is more more in the office, not 80 to 90 percent. And then the way we run our superintendent is in the field. Um, so for me, it's kind of what's that ratio? What's that good ratio for for a builder? But um, how do you guys run on residential, like a PM to super ratio? Do you have, I mean, I know there's everything's, Fluid, I yeah. No word, but <laughs> fluid. No, it is. Everything is fluid. Everything changes depending on what you know how the business is run, the complication of projects, diversity, um, location, right, uh, geography. All that goes into play to depend on commute. So for us, as we look at that, you know, I have seventeen employees. So we we've grown as a company. There's there's eighteen of us now, and the way I run my field is I do have a super that's on every project, and you know they're just like any other company. I have a superintendent. And my project managers are more of a hybrid. So my when they have the, t- the title of superintendent, they're truly a superintendent, right? They're working on the schedule. They're making the phone calls. They're working on um, everything that has to do with the actual build. But as far as the back end side, whether it be the accounting, the financial, the contracting, the scope of work, they're not involved in that, right? Whereas my PMs mm-hmm. yep. are, you know, they're, they're kind of overseeing that. And so, all my PMs, I have three project managers. All of them have their own project, so which is a little unique. I think that's unique to most companies. So they yeah. have their own project, but then they also are overseeing the superintendents on theirs. So they have their own baby out there that's typically one of my more complicated projects. That's why I have them there. And then they're overseeing a super or two or three supers on their projects. And mm-hmm. so they're really in charge of all of that. And then in addition, they're doing all the back end, right? Working with contracts and scope and change orders. And so that so our ratio is typically uh, each project manager is overseeing two and then they have their own. So they have like three under their plate. Interesting. What's the, if you had an average residential um, construction contract value, what's your average build right now? Um, our oh, average nice. build, yeah, is probably in uh, about four to 5 million is typically the average 
construction contract we have. And that's swayed a little bit. I mean, most of them are in that three to five million. We do have a couple over 10 million, which kind of sways the curve a little bit. But um, right now we have two, two remodels that are both um, in the low two million. So they're big renovations. Okay. And those are our least expensive projects. So we have two, we have one that's like 2.4 and one that's like 2.1. And then everything else is typically over three. So if you want to answer this, do you prefer new builds or remodels? Maybe you don't. Oh, I'll answer that all day. I a hundred percent new builds. I mean, remodels are a, a complete bear. There's um, yep. you have to have the right person out there. And the only reason we're doing these is because they're amazing clients who we have a relationship with, right? right. Renovation renovations are really difficult. They're really challenging. They, they can consume every bit of your labor. And it really just depends how you run your operation, right? I have a pure mind that, strictly does remodels, but he self performs. He has his own tile guy, his own electrician, his own framer. So for him, it's a slam dunk, right? For me, I'm subbing it out. So as a ge true general contractor to yeah. sub out a remodel, it's, in it's incredibly challenging yeah. at times, yeah. depending on if it's the right project. Yeah. Yeah. We've talked about doing that before. We don't have the, the labor or the manpower to make it um, mm -hmm. advantageous for the client, you know, right? Um, so if you have to sub out the demo, sub out the framing, sub out hanging too many hands in the pot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so we both use Builder Trend, um, huge part of our company, big part of your company as well. Uh, tell me a little bit about, and you know, they're just down the road from us in Omaha, Nebraska. I know you're close. So, <laughs> we went to we went to the Builder Trend University here recently. Um, Reese and I, that was a good experience. Um, how has Builder Trend simplified your business, and kind of um, do you guys use it also? Do you use the entire platform? Do you use only parts of it? Kind of tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a good question. So build a trend completely changed our business, right? As we started to grow and expand and we were really lacking in the communication side as far as how we communicate with clients, how we document. And then when we got one to build a trend, met them, met the team there, it's totally transformed everything because now, and it's even become a sales pitch. I mean, keep in mind, Blake, for me, half of my clients are out of state, right? I'm yeah. in Scottsdale. Yeah. And many of them are our second home clients. So to have a portal for them, owner portal, which has been just a huge advantage for us having the, uh, you know, running the schedule through there, the daily logs, which is super important. I mean, the daily logs for us are a major component of what we do. Um, and there's a lot of reasons, you know, I just had an issue with one of my subcontractors on performance, right. And who's been delaying the project. And, you know, it's easy for them to say, Oh, we've been there or have every excuse, you know, but it's really easy when I can pull up the daily logs and show, you know, how many days they weren't on site, Mm -hmm. what time they're showing up and leaving. And then, you know, he was pretty surprised to see just all that documentation. So yeah. um, for what it's worth, I think that's advantageous, you know, the unlimited cloud, you know, the documentation. And so um, those, those are huge resources for us. And the only thing I'm not using, but we use it for every part of our business except accounting. And the only reason we haven't is because of um, outside of AFT, you know, we have, you know, 11 other LLCs of, you know, mm -hmm. other aspects that we've either invested in or our partners in, uh, and, and they're all different industries. And so from an accounting side, it's just a lot easier to keep all of that together for my controller in <clears> one <throat> spot 100%. and, and feel that, yeah, if we were just a builder, if we were just AFT and that was it, there's no question. Everything would be run through the billing software that they have. Yeah. Um, what percentage of your subcontractors would you say are actively on builder trend? Oh, that's a good question. You know, um, you know, I'd, I'd say probably 50%. Um, yeah, that's probably about where we're at too. Yeah. And, and even with that, I think it's important that as they get the notifications and, you know, information, look, the reality is in our business, especially right now, like it still falls on the superintendent, right? You got to call follow up and make sure they're seeing schedule changes, you know, tasks to be completed. I mean, it's just like anything, right? That's, that's why we're hired. So. 100%. Yeah. So uh, the big COVID word. So the last uh, two years, obviously, in construction with lead times, prices, everything. Um, how has COVID changed your business for the good or bad? Or what, what have you even seen any change? Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's kind of a, a loaded question in this way is that in, in some ways, it's good, right? A lot of us have been benefit, been the beneficiary of a lot of work. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been a big demand. People, uh, especially here in Phoenix, which is probably similar to most of the country, all of a sudden you're locked in your house. And so now it's like, well, 
do I have a home office when I'm on Zoom calls? How's my technology, right? Uh, my kids are working from home. Do we have space? Do we have recreation outside? Do I have a backyard? Is my pool up to date? Mm -hmm. You know, so there's things here where there's immediate needs because they're not traveling. They're not on the go. They're at home. So do we have these amenities? And so that's increased the demand, right? Which is great for us. Well, with increased demand comes limited supply chain. So where it's put a strain on us as well, pricing has been really hard, especially for us where we're doing uh, these major projects that are typically three to four years. And the reason I say that, I mean, they're a year to two years in design. And then, you know, mm -hmm. uh, none of them are built in a year right now. So typically about a year and a half to two years for the build. In some cases, two and a half years, depending on, you know, like our big houses. So right. when you're dealing with that, that's where these are long processes and try to control costs for our clients, which we do everything we can to stay current. I mean, it's just a lot. And COVID's really impacted that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're... I don't know what fuel lead times are the same as ours, but like garage doors, 20 weeks, um, windows, windows, eight to 20, just depends. Um, Pella, we use Pella as well. Impervia is, you know, the sliders are 20, like a slider door, patio door, 20 to 22 weeks right now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're just, we're dealing with something <laughs> like that. It's, well, it's funny because even the production builders now, you know, fortunately for us, we have um, lead times so that we can work around you know, we can order product, we can store, we can inventory it. But like these production builders, you know, Arizona is a big market for swimming pools, right? It's hot. Like right. yeah. in the summer, you need a pool. So these production builders are not even allowing clients to build pools in their homes anymore, at really? least until the house is closed. Yeah. When they close the house, yeah, they can contract and do their own, but they're not running through the build because what's happening is, is pool builds typically would take 12 weeks and now are taking a year. So Wow. You think a production builder is trying to finish a home in three months, maybe, maybe four. And, uh, you know, the, the pool completely delayed closing. So for them, they just said, we're out of the pool industry. You're on your own. You know, yeah. we got to get the house built and then you can figure it out. So things like that have affected the client for sure in, in regard to COVID. Yeah. One one more question. Um, when On your custom builds, do you guys carry the construction loan or do you have the client do that typically? Uh, good question. So... Uh, we don't have any speculative bills, no specs. We don't have any of our own development. Everything's built the suit catered to the client. So in our market, our clients are purchasing all of the land themselves. Mm -hmm. So they own the land and then they are taking the construction loan and carrying all the construction loans. So we don't have any uh, costs from our side. And, and I should just clarify one thing. So out of all of our projects that we have, we have one that and this is a COVID thing, which I've had a couple of these where you're working a year and a half through design and the price now is way out of control for lumber or concrete and the buyers get cold feet and say, we're not building. You're right. We've had some drop off and that's the nature of it. Well, we had one client, we had got through design and permit and it's their location was really unique. It's on the golf course, amazing lot. Mm -hmm. And with just that year and a half to get to permit, I know how hard it is to get a permit right now. They, they weren't going to move forward with the build. So I elected to purchase the land and permit from them. Gotcha. And then we sold it actually in the first week before we even broke ground. We sold wow. it. And so we're building, we're building for a client. So that one's kind of a, it's a hybrid of uh, yeah. deposits they've made, earnest money that they've put in, as well as some more financing until it closes. But outside of that, everything is built with suit. Yeah, very good. Um, I thought of another one. I know I said one more, but uh, do you, oh, you typically do a lot more cost plus or lump sum agreements? Another great question. Going back to your COVID question, uh, we were a little bit of both um, in the past, you know, and it really depended on the client. Now we're 100% cost plus. Everything's cost plus. We've, we've changed our whole program. Uh, despite COVID, I, I found that if you run cost plus, understanding your numbers, understanding um, how to communicate that to the client. It's actually super advantageous for both the contractor and the client. Um, you know, I know a lot of builders push back saying there's money, you're possibly leaving on the table for buyout or negotiation. But the reality is with cost plus, it just becomes a very involved process with their clients. And with this big of an investment that they're making, it's been a slam dunk. So we're yeah, all 100% cost plus. Builds a lot of trust and, you know, honesty mm -hmm. and whatnot. So, yeah. yeah. Very good. Well, if you could give one piece of advice to um, maybe someone that's looking to start a business or an entrepreneur getting started, what was what would the that piece of advice be? Oh, that's really good. I mean, I could go like twenty <laughs> different directions here, but 
Um, I think the biggest thing, especially as an entrepreneur, is at some point, all of us, as we've taken that entrepreneurship journey, we've had people that have impacted mentors, right? And so find a mentor. I've always, one of my big things is chase experience, not money. And so it's really easy to get caught up in the financial side of things, but find that experience. And that can mean a lot of different things. It could be working for uh, a firm before starting your own. It could be that, hey, as an entrepreneur, you know, we all have an SOP, right? An operating procedure, how we're going to do business. Mm -hmm. And for example, going back to the cost plus, we may say, hey, we're doing cost plus, here's our rate. But there may be an opportunity going back to Chase Experience where, hey, I can um, go build this home in a, in a community where I want my sign. It's a high end community and I'm going to do it at a discount. But again, I'm chasing that experience because now I'm getting this prestigious project in the right side of town and I can build my brand. And you're looking how to catapult that. So it's always yeah. finding ways to catapult experiences to build a brand and just chase that experience, not the money. Because, yeah, you may not make money on that first one, you know, chasing that experience to do this hillside build or whatever. Um, but that will come down the road, especially as you start to build that credibility. Yeah. And just, yeah, I, I would I would say the same thing along the lines of just, you know, building your network is so important of just people. Just go out and have that coffee with someone or beer or whatever it is. And, um really get to know people. So, yep. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Brad, for coming on today. I appreciate your time. I know you're a very, very busy guy with between business and family and um, all the other LLCs you got out there. So <laughs> thanks again yeah. for your time. And um, if, if any of the people watching this or listening to this, don't follow Brad on social media, you will find him all over um, YouTube, <laughs> LinkedIn, Instagram, Probably Facebook. I don't follow you too much on Facebook. I'm sure you're on there too. So, oh yeah, we're on there and Pinterest. I mean, we're on all of them and it's just AFT construction, you know, stands for a finer touch construction and LinkedIn. We, we do have an, a finer, a finer touch construction page, but most people on LinkedIn know me because I post on my personal account, which is Brad Levin. Yep. And that's, that, that's how we do it as well. So, all right, Brad, thank you so much. And I hope you have a wonderful day. You got it. Thanks, Blake. Thanks.